So how do you introduce an episode about the queen of rock and roll? Maybe by mentioning that she's one of the most successful performers of all time, having sold more than 200 million albums. Or perhaps you talk about the incredible obstacles she's had to overcome in her personal life. Or, as the song says, maybe you just acknowledge that she's simply the best and move on from there. So, in honor of her recent 81st birthday, here are 10 things we think you should know about Tina Turner. Welcome to the Stewie Tune Show. These are insights and commentary on the music and musicians that shape our lives. And now, let's go back to class with your hosts, Tony Stewart and Aaron Badgley. Well, good evening, Mr. Badgley. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing just fine. Um, a lot of snow here in Toronto. No military called out. It's a win-win. Yeah, exactly. You know what? Our snow was uh, actually disappearing, but uh, we got a little dusting today, but that's it. But, uh, you know, I do have to tell the audience at home, we have been having tech troubles tonight. Yeah, little is... gremlins running around here. Yeah, but we, we think we've got it working, so <laughs> we had to turn to an alternative solution to record this. Let's... Uh... <laughs> Let's hope it works. But uh, this is going to be a very special episode because on November 26th, the queen of rock and roll, Tina Turner, turned 81. And uh, what an incredible life and career she's had. I mean, I don't even know where to start when you're talking about Tina Turner. And she's had um, way more comebacks than anyone that I know. Yeah. I mean, she's defied the odds at uh, at every oh. turn. It, just, when, just when you thought, boy... Um, you know, maybe her career's done, something else happens. And in fact, we'll be talking about later, later this episode, uh, the latest one was July of this year. It's That's a, right. absolutely incredible. So, um, have we, you ever seen her live in concert? No, I haven't. Have you? No, my brother did. He said she was amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Well, yeah. It always blows me away. You know, I was talking uh, with a colleague today about this because I told her I was doing an episode on Tina Turner and she's a fan, <laughs> but you know, Tina Turner, uh, is doing, Mick Jagger shtick, but uh, in heels and a miniskirt. Like it's, it's incredible, right? The, the dancing and, she, and she's singing in tune. So yep. Yep. absolutely. Without, without lip syncing. Yeah. Without lip syncing. Absolutely astounding. And uh, I was watching one of the clips today from 2000 and she was 61 on stage there. All of her backup dancers were in their twenties, you know? And, and uh, I mean, I, sh- it was it was crazy and uh, yeah. fabulous. So what a what a tremendous artist and person. And uh, I'm looking forward to recording tonight because I'm a big fan. Yeah. Well, can we can we just say something weird? You said you found your private dancer album. Yes. And I was listening to it here when you texted me that you just found your album. Well, you know what? I guess after nine episodes, right? We're just <laughs> telepathic now with each other. So <laughs> I think so. I think so. <laughs> well, shall we uh, get started? We shall. We shall indeed. So here is our list of 10 things that we thought you might want to know about Tina Turner. So we'll start with, uh, you know, the obvious one. Uh, Tina Turner is not her real name. I guess it is her real name now, but uh, she was born Anna Mae Bullock and she grew up in uh, Nutbush, Tennessee. And uh, she met Ike Turner uh, in 1957. She was 17 years old and uh, was very impressed by seeing Ike at a concert. And after a little while, she got on stage and through a series of circumstances, I'm not going to talk about all those here on the show, but uh, she ended up singing with Ike's band and they loved her. And uh, Ike decided he realized what he had on his hands and he decided to change her name to Tina. And, uh, he was thinking of that. Do you remember the Sheena of the jungle, that character? That's, sure. Yeah. Of that's, course. that's what he was thinking of supposedly when he, uh, decided to call her Tina. And then even though they weren't married yet, they were in a relationship. He changed her last name to, uh, Turner, his last name. And in a big time foreshadowing of what was to come, He trademarked the name Tina Turner, and his thinking was is that if she ever left him, then uh, he owned the name, and someone else could just step in and be the new Tina Turner. So, wow, why is that incredible? It is incredible, and uh, you know, later on when we talk about her lawsuit, I mean, obviously she uh, won the right to keep the name, but uh, yeah, so that was his uh, reasoning was that uh, should she ever leave him, uh, we're going to have someone be able to come in and be the new Tina Turner. So, pretty incredible. You know what's what's amazing is do you know what the population of uh, nut pushes today? Oh, I have no idea. 
1,500. That's it. Yeah, it's a small little town, eh? Like, it's just a... I mean, and she put it on the map. I mean, she, she wrote that song, Nutbush City Limits. Mm-hmm. Great song. Uh, she put it on the map, so there you go. But, you know um, what? It's incredible, eh? All these artists who came from these little, tiny, yeah, uh, you know, towns out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, incredible. All right, so what do you got next? Am I talking about the movies? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and talk about the movies. All right, sure. we'll talk about the movies. Well, you know, I was going to talk about either the movies or her books, but let's go with the movies. Okay. So she, um, <laughs> folks, the gremlins are at it tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, she made her film debut uh, in 1966 in a movie called um, The Big TNT Show or The Tammy Show. She played herself. She's just saying, she sang with um, Mike Turner, you know. But she started getting into dramatic acting. If you want to, I mean, I think it's dramatic. She played the Acid Queen in Tommy. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that movie. Uh, Ken Russell directed it, and she did a great job as the Acid Queen. I think she she killed the Who's version. I think she she made it her own, literally in that film. Um, pretty pretty tough uh, tough act to follow. And she didn't actually make another film until. Well, she was in Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, but the less said about that, the better. Yeah. Um, Bee Gees I, and Peter Frampton doing the Beatles, man. No. <laughs> I agree. Uh, then she, she had her, their biggest dramatic role was in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Beyond Thunderdome. And she also did the theme song to that film, We Don't Need Another Hero. Yeah, that was a huge hit. Massive. And, and did you remember her costume in that film? Yes. I mean, she she pioneered the whole not pioneer, but she was like the tough lady and great, great, uh, great movie, great scene, and she was awesome. And finally, here's a little trivia: she played the mayor in a movie called The Last Action Hero with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Believe it or not, she was the mayor. Had a oh, really? Not a big role, but she had the she was in that. So she's she's and, and of course tons and tons and tons of television. But um, yeah, so she's actually dabbled in film and uh she could have made it as an actress i think she had the great she had the looks the ability the emotion uh, she could have made it yeah i agree and uh you know last action hero do you remember when that came out the expectations were around that were enormous and it was what what did it have like a 200 million dollar budget or something crazy and i mean it just died <laughs> it bombed <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you probably know, a yeah. lot of people out there have probably never seen that movie but <laughs> <laughs> Google it, folks. Google it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So her relationship with Ike Turner, I mean, obviously they were uh, a, a really big in the uh, 60s and 70s um, until the mid 70s. And, you know, on the, on the outside, the, the happy couple and but on the inside, Ike Turner was abusive and controlling. And uh, she hid that for a long time. And uh she finally decided to leave him in 1976. I mean, things she had tried to commit suicide at one point during their marriage, and um, things were so bad because he controlled every facet of her life that at one point she was actually, I don't know if you know this, but, uh, but she was borrowing money from one of the Ikeettes just to try to, you know, to, to have some money because Ike wouldn't give her anything. That's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And finally, uh, there was one time when she, uh, the last time that he beat her, she had enough and she left him and she had 36 cents in her pocket and a mobile gas card. And that's it. And she, she ran away, uh, stayed with a friend, filed for divorce. And this divorce proceedings were, um, two years before she was finally able to finalize the divorce. She was able to, she was granted the right to keep the name of Tina Turner, but, uh, Ike, was lawyered up to the max and she ended up being on the hook for his legal expenses, which I didn't know that until this year. And so she had to make the round of all the talk shows that were popular at the time. She was appearing everywhere because she was on the hook for all this money to cover Ike's expenses, which was uh, terrible. Amazing. Amazing. You know, that, well, you know, you said it foreshadowing, right? When he says, I'm keeping the name in case you leave me, because there can always be another Tina. You know what I mean? Yep. Pretty controlling. Very yep. controlling. And so, I mean, things were not looking good for her, but uh, uh, in the show notes, you know, I mentioned this, that uh, success is the ultimate revenge. And, and in that regard, she sure got her revenge on him, boy. Um, so uh, what do you got next? 
I'm kind of connected to that because what Tina Turner did too was in 86, she, she wrote her first autobiography, a book called I, Tina. And here's a, here's a fantastically popular celebrity talking about being controlled, abused, held captive, trying desperately to get away, the struggles to get away. I mean, it was a very brave thing to do for, for a woman in her, um, situation. I mean, she was being, she was very honest. And, and I don't know if you've read the book, but it's what she does is she also gets people who are in, in her life to talk about her too. So she, she writes it from her perspective, but then she also gets, which, you know, I work, I, I, you know, for a lot of abused women, sometimes they need people to fill in the blanks, quite frankly. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great book to read. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Mr. Mr. Turner came out with his own book called, um, you know, taking my name, taking back my name. Ah, dear, dear, dear. But, um, I tend to turn into a film starring Angela Bassett called What's Love Got to Do With It? Yeah, and, I've seen that film. Oh, it's a great movie. And did you, it's Tina Turner singing. That's not Angela Bassett. Although, mm-hmm. I bet you she could sing too, because I love Angela Bassett. <laughs> yeah, same here. 911, can't wait for it to come back on. Um, but so it's a great film, but, but as I said, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really terrific read. Now, she didn't stop there. She wrote two more books after that. Um, and she actually just published a book. I think it was two years ago, and the title just escaped me. But uh, she's still writing, and she's still, you know, adding on to her story, which is important to do. And uh, anyway, it's very brave, very brave of that lady to come out with that uh, the book. Yeah, and I'm looking at the notes that you wrote here. She's got one coming out this month. Happiness Becomes You, A Guide to Changing Your Life for Good, coming out in December. Yeah. And she also wrote a book called My... My love story, a memoir, but yes, she has a book coming out in 2020 or December. And, um, you know what? That's a, it's a not about a Christmas idea gift, no. you know, hint, oh, hint. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, happiness becomes you a guide to changing your life for good. A great title. Um, I look, I look forward to reading that. I don't know. I don't, I haven't read any reviews for it yet or, um, so we'll see what happens. Well, I find her her life and her career are fascinating. And, you know, I was mentioning to you I when I taught that rock history course in the high school, uh, she resonated especially with the girls, you know. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and when I was asking them at the end of the course who, you know, stuck with you the most, I, I was pretty overwhelming, Tina Turner. Um, not only for the music, of course, but for the life story and for the obstacles that uh, she overcame. And as we said at the beginning, I mean, she has had so many career resurgences, absolutely incredible. And we're going to be taking a break in a minute because, uh, you know, but this looked like it was going to be break time on her career after she left Ike and she was making the, uh, the rounds on all the talk shows. And then she was doing small gigs here and there. And it didn't, Mm -hmm. didn't look like anything was, uh, was going to happen. But uh, after the break, we'll talk about uh, 1984 and private dancer. Boy, what a, (laughs) what an iconic album and what a, what a game changer for her. So uh, let's take our music history moment. And Aaron, uh, I've got a double Beatles music history moment for you. (laughs) So I think you'll enjoy this one. No doubt. All right, let's take a break. This week, we've got two Beatles stories separated by exactly five years. On December 5th, 1960, in Hamburg, Germany, Paul McCartney and Pete Best were arrested for pinning a condom to a brick wall and then igniting it. The Beatles were kicked out of Germany, discouraged at their career prospects. Exactly five years later, in 1965, the Beatles played their last ever show in Liverpool at the Liverpool Empire. Only 5,100 tickets were available, but there were 40,000 applications for tickets to the show. On top of that, they also had the number one single in the UK with We Can Work It Out. A lot can happen in five years. And now, back to the show. And we're back. And uh, Aaron, I thought you'd enjoy that one, uh, especially space five years apart like that to the day. I know, it's it's funny. I was just thinking, I was saying to you, you know, what a difference five years makes. Do you know why they um, they lit the condom on fire? I don't. I just, I'm wondering what's going through your mind. Hey, let's light this condom on fire. I don't. 
the, the, the place they were staying in in Germany didn't have any windows and the light bulb burnt out and they were packing to leave. Okay. So they looked for something to burn, like a candle. They, they reasoned that <laughs> a condom was very similar to a candle. So if they light it, it'll stay lit for a long time. It went up in seconds. <laughs> I can imagine. Now I'm surprised from the stories that I've heard about the Beatles and their habits and their womanizing that they actually had a spare condom around to use. You know? <laughs> I'm not commenting. No. <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> no, exactly. We won't go too much further on that one. But, no, uh, no. Uh, they were legendary, supposedly. So, and I just want to add one very quick thing. Uh, we could work it out. Seventh largest selling single in the 1960s. Wow. Yeah. So there you go. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, five years. So okay. speaking of big accomplishments, Tina Turner is in the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, she has sold more concert tickets than any solo artist in history. And I tried to find the number, uh, and I can't find the number, but the record is still there. She is still has more concert tickets sold than any solo artist in history. So that that's incredible. It just goes to show you her longevity. And um, we were talking before the show, you know, since the age of 45, she's released 10 albums and 11 world tours. Like how unbelievable is that? I know. And there's people half her age who can't keep up with that pace. Nope. You know? So she's also, for a while, uh, had the record for the largest stadium audience. It's since been broken. But at one point, she had the largest stadium audience. She was playing at Macaranha Stadium in Rio de Janeiro. Uh in Brazil, and there were 180,000 people there. So that was a record that stood for a while, and it's I, I forget who's broken it now, but again, amazing, amazing. It was, it was Paul McCartney. Oh, did it Paul? Did Paul? <laughs> well, uh, where? Same place. Uh, well, it was uh, in Brazil, and I think it was the same stadium. They just squeezed in a few more people. But, he, uh, he just said, I, I want to uh, bump Tina <laughs> off the charts. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, invited a few friends and family to pad the audience. And <laughs> but you know, when you talk about yeah, exactly when you talk about t Tina Turner selling tickets too, keep in mind that when she was selling selling tickets in the sixties, seventies, and eighties, we didn't have you know you didn't buy tickets online. You didn't buy you didn't buy them on the phone. You just have to get. Do you remember the days of lining up to buy tickets? Yes, I sure do. Yeah, you know. So hey, people were going out to see her, and they were supporting her. I tell you. Yeah, I have watched so much live footage of her, especially when I was teaching that class, and and uh, just an, a a great performer. And uh, I'm sure any concert of hers, you would have left there uh, blown away. Oh, hundred uh, percent. And and uh, you know she's again the consummate performer, right? I mean, just great performer. But now I'm going to turn it over to you, and you had something about uh, a magazine appearance that was pretty notable. So. Very notable because this is in 1967, uh, November 25th to be exact. She made the cover of the, of the magazine Rolling Stone. Um, she was the first black artist and the first woman to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. Um, and that's pretty incredible given that, you know, this is 67. Luckily, Rolling Stone didn't wait till issue 5,000. They, they got it, they got it right early on. They got her on the second cover, but still pretty noteworthy for an artist, uh, for her, for her to be on the cover of the Rolling Stone. And, um, you know, she, she was on it several times since then, mm -hmm. 69, 71, the 80s, 84, uh, 85. I mean, just 80, you know, she's just been on it countless times. Deservedly so, but in 1967, she was the first black artist and the first woman to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. Great photo of her. Unfortunately, or fortunately, but, you know, when you read the article, because I, I dug up the article, and the first line is, Tina Turner is an incredible chick. Oh, of course. That <laughs> very groovy 60s language. <laughs> very groovy. <laughs> 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 Sorry, just, I love that. I, I'm a, a little, a uh, I'm a little surprised, you know, that uh, she's on there without Ike. Actually, uh, you know, based on that whole relationship and how domineering and controlling he was, so that's pretty cool. Well, you're right, and and just by you know, you can just imagine that Ike probably wasn't very thrilled about that because Ike Ike Turner thought he was the 
the draw. He, she, as you said earlier, right? I can replace her, but I'm Mike Turner. So it must have been a bit of a blow to his ego. Oh, and, and you know who took the photo, by the way? Robert yep. Altman, the director. Oh. Yeah. So there you go. Oh, very Yeah, cool. he, he couldn't have been happy about that at all. No, I'm sure he wasn't. So uh, all these obstacles that she's had to overcome in her life. Uh, she was uh, raised Baptist, uh, very religious, uh, but converted to Buddhism. And uh, Buddhism is a big part of her life. And she has said that uh, meditation got her through all these times, all these troubling times over the years that she's had to go through. And um, so I know in her new book that's coming out, she's going to be talking about that quite a bit, but um, she's actually met the Dalai Lama, which... Really? Yeah. That's, I thought that was very, very cool. And um, yeah, Buddhism's a big part of her life. And, uh, you know, she's taught other people about meditation. And uh, so uh, a big part of helping her deal with, with what she's had to go through, because, I mean, she's just had so many struggles, you know? It's amazing, again, you know, you see how some form of religion or spirituality, I'm going to use the word spirituality, comes into play. Um, and and this is not a slag, but you wouldn't know it from listening to her music. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't think, oh, here's a Buddhist. <laughs> oh, exactly. Know? I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying it. It, it, it doesn't. It just it wouldn't. It wouldn't occur to you. But yeah, see, it's it's very cool that she is. Uh, I wonder if she's a vegetarian as well. I don't know about that. I have a feeling she might be. I think so too. I was just. I, I was. I was just off topic. I didn't really share has been a vegetarian for the last 40 years and she's an animal rights activist. So, mm -hmm. so you know what? Tina Turner could very well be a vegetarian. I'll, I'll look it up, but I, it's interesting to know. I think um, I watched the uh, interview she had with Oprah. Uh, do you remember when she got married and she, uh, to her current husband, uh, Erwin Bach, and um, during her honeymoon, she took a little bit of time to appear with Oprah. And I'm pretty, right. I'm pretty sure uh, during that interview that she mentioned that she was vegetarian, but um, yeah, her. Uh, so for those who don't know, uh, Tina Turner is a citizen of Switzerland right now, and she an renounced her uh, American citizenship. So she's currently living in uh, Switzerland. And uh, you and I were joking last night that I should ring up her chateau and see if she'll call in. But uh, did, did you call? Well, you know, I couldn't get through, and uh, the, but the butler wouldn't let me pass. You know, so. <laughs> and 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 she is indeed a vegetarian. You're right. She is okay. All right. So, uh, oh, oh, I can't wait till you talk about this one. These duets, yeah. Well, th this is, and it's kind of connected to what you're going to talk about about private dancers. So I'm not going to kind of steal any Thunderdome, but uh, <laughs> prior to private dancer. She did a she did a record with a group called BEF. Now BEF is a band in England called British Electronic Foundation, also known as Heaven Seventeen. And she did a cover of Ball of Confusion. You know that's what the world is today. Mm -hmm. hey, and that was a big hit in England. And uh, it led to their working on the album Private Dancer. But she's worked with uh, David Bowie on a song called Tonight. Uh, you, you were watching the video, I believe you said last night, right? Oh, yeah, this afternoon, video. yeah. This afternoon, right. Um, Bowie, she's on the studio version. Bowie's on her live album, worth checking out. She had a big hit with Brian Adams, It's Only Love. Um, she worked with Clapton, a song called Tearing Us Apart. And Rod Stewart, you know the song It Takes Two. Oddly enough, in 1982, she agreed to appear on a, on an Ike Turner album. And I love this. The song she chose to sing with him was "Shame, Shame, Shame." Yeah, I was uh, shocked when I when I saw your notes and you you put that I, in. I just love that. I think that's pure genius. Quite frankly, pure genius. Exactly. And there, there's another duet which I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a bit later during our six degrees uh, portion of the show. Okay, that sounds perfect. And I'm going to um, just wander off the path a little bit here. Uh, so, her, do you remember how big of a hit that? Uh, duet with Brian Adams was? Oh, massive. That was massive. massive. And did you know that uh, Brian Adams sang at her wedding? That I didn't know. Yeah. So he's, See, I didn't know that. Yeah. I've seen footage of the ceremony and uh, he sang at her wedding and they're very good friends uh, still. 
very, very close. Yeah, uh, that's super cool. That's super cool. Yeah, isn't it? So a little Canadian connection there. And you know what? Before we go to break, let's take a minute and talk about Private Dancer because um, she sort of was, like we were saying, doing the small shows. And um, Rod Stewart invited her on to Saturday Night Live in 1981 to do uh, Hot Legs with him and that's right uh, yes and that kind of started the ball rolling again generating some more interest but uh man it was private dancer you know she was 45 years old when private dancer came out so you know the sad reality for female artists in the music business is usually by the time you're in your 40s you're done and uh here's tina turner coming out with this monster album having more success than she ever had in her career at the age of 45 do you know who wrote the song Private Dancer? I'm trying to remember. Uh, no. Mark Knopfler. Oh, wow. Dire Straits, Mark Knopfler. Yeah. yeah, Dire Straits, Mark Knopfler. And he plays on the track, too. And it's it's the best track on the album, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, yeah. what's love got to do with it and all that? But, but boy, I agree with you. It's, it's a killer album, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I uh, I had my vinyl out today, Mike. And like you said, you were kind of checking it out at the same time. So, but yeah, she was 45 years old when she made that. Like, what a, uh, that's incredible. And now, yeah, I know, and as you put it, as you point out, being a female artist, you know, it's, it's hard to kind of keep that up. With that. Well, look at Stevie Nicks. I mean, she she's she's still great, but she's not held in the same regard. And it's a lot of ageism, right? I oh, mean, for it sure. Has to do, because she's still, her voice is still as good as ever. I saw some clips of the, the most recent Fleetwood Mac tour. Stevie still sounds amazing. Oh, she's, you know? yeah. Yep. Unfortunately, that's the reality for uh, female artists. But, uh, you know, you like to think that Tina broke, uh, broke out of that for sure. Well, this looks like a great spot for us to take our birthday break. And we've got a really important one. So we'll uh, go to our birthday uh, and we'll be right back. We're celebrating another important birthday today. On December 5th, 1932, the music world changed forever with the arrival of one of rock and roll's true pioneers, Richard Wayne Penniman, better known by his stage name of Little Richard. His aggressive style of piano playing and singing and his flamboyant personality were a huge influence on many performers, including the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, and even Jimi Hendrix. Sadly, Little Richard left us on May 9th of this year after a battle with bone cancer. He was 87. And we're back. And what a birthday that one is, eh? Well, you know, little Richard, uh, I don't know, you know, he's he, it, one of the greatest influences of all time. His, his music was the first song Bob Dylan ever sang professionally when he was uh, starting, up, starting off in Hibbing, Minnesota. And the other thing is, as you may or may not, I mean, there wouldn't be a prince without oh, for sure. Little Richard. There wouldn't be. And um, Little Richard always used to love to tell the story that he taught Paul Harvey, trademark Beatles, I can't do it, but you know, the, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Paul McCartney. Paul McC- uh, he taught, the Beatles toured with them. Well, they did a few shows with Little Richard in 1962. And McCartney admitted it. That Little Richard said, no, 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 Paul, you do it this way. Ooh. And uh, there you go. So Little Richard influencing everybody from Motorhead to James Brown to Ray Charles. I mean, he just was an incredible, incredible force. And that's all he was, was a force of nature. And wasn't that movie appearance, that that was what inspired uh, Paul McCartney in the first place, wasn't it? His appearance. I can't uh, remember the name of the movie, but. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the Girl Can't Help It. Yes, yes. Um, and and, and inter- interesting story about The Girl Can't Help It, which is a film that Little Richard's in. I don't know if, you know, for those of you who know the Beatles and they were, they were going through the breakup and Let It Be, they stopped recording Let It Be because the BBC was showing The Girl Can't Help It for the first time. And all the Beatles stopped fighting and went to Paul's house to watch The Girl Can't Help It on TV. Yeah, so, there yeah, you go. Big, big influence. All right, so we're down to our final uh, two points about Tina Turner. And uh, she got married to Erwin Bach in 2013 and um, decided to move to Switzerland permanently. So she's got her Swiss citizenship now, and she renounced her marriage. Is he Swiss? Is he Swiss? He is German or Swiss. I can't remember which. But um, they live in like a, a, almost like a chateau in Switzerland now. And uh, 
Within weeks of her wedding, she had a stroke and she had to learn to walk again. So uh, health complications since 2013. And then she struggled with intestinal cancer and she's uh, since overcome that. And then um, in 2017, she nearly died of kidney failure and the chances of a donor were low. And she was actually uh, considering assisted suicide. Um, Finally, uh, her husband, Erwin Bach, donated one of his kidneys. So uh, you talk about uh, like a wedding gift, boy. Um, So she uh, she has one of her husband's kidneys. That's I thought that was pretty amazing. That's you know, you, 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 it doesn't. Uh, it's amazing to me how she went from the marriage with Ike Turner to to a guy that would. I mean, it's just it's polar ends of the uh, spectrum, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's incredible. And uh, so let's get down to our final point, and this one uh, I think is impressive, and and we can both talk about this one. But she in the UK. Well, first of all, she was the first artist to have a top 40 hit in six consecutive uh, decades. Do you remember back in 2010 when uh, Simply the Best made it back on the charts? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So it went to, it made it to number nine on the charts and it, uh, the Rangers football club in Scotland, uh, they, uh, that's a a important song for them, you know, because I'm not sure how much you know about soccer culture, but they sing all through the game. I mean, no matter what's happening, it's uh, they're singing and (laughs) chanting and uh, a group of fans uh, started an online campaign to get simply the best back onto the charts and they succeeded. So in 2010, it made it to number nine. So she became the first artist uh, to have uh, a top 40 hit in six consecutive decades. And now Just July of this year, she's the first artist to um, have a a hit in seven consecutive decades. What what song of this year? It was a a remix of What's Love Got to Do With It, and she did it with a Norwegian producer named Kygo. Now, I'm not familiar with Kygo, but uh, it was was a remix of What's Love Got to Do With It. So seven consecutive decades of having a top 40. Can you imagine? Yeah. Can uh, you imagine? 70 years of top 40 hits. And, and as you say, how many people, how many people artists can, can say that, you know? Yeah. And this, uh, this has been a, a tremendous episode to record, Aaron. I mean, I have so much admiration and respect for Tina Turner and uh, so glad we had the opportunity today to talk about her. Well, do you know what? It's, it's funny because she's, she's this incredible artist that sometimes, and, 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 Forgive me for saying this, but I don't know about Ottawa radio. I don't hear her on Toronto radio that often. I'll hear her on satellite radio, but sometimes I get this, I get worried that she's almost forgotten here, you know, and, and she shouldn't be because she's quite amazing. And, uh, so I'm, I'm with you. I'm glad we got to talk about her. And it's, it's, it's funny, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm probably tomorrow I'll start hearing her on the radio again because that's what happened with Billy Joel. The day after we did our show, we kept hearing Billy Joel pop up on, <laughs> on, on Boom 97.3. So maybe, I hope so because she should get played. She's an art, she's an awesome artist. Yes, I agree. And so I am really looking forward to see how you're going to tie uh, Tina Turner to the <laughs> Beatles. So let's cue up the six degrees of Beatle Mano. Bain- uh, I can't talk tonight. <laughs> Let's it's the up. gremlins. It's the gremlins. <laughs> I don't know whether I'll leave that in or not. We'll see. But uh, let's let's cue up the uh, six degrees of Beatlemania, and uh, and then let's hear what you got. All right, Aaron, hit me with some Beatlemania. <laughs> Well, this is this is kind of interesting. I think you're going to like this. Um, 1986. I don't have the exact day, but in 1986, during the Prince's Trust concert in London, England, Paul McCartney and Tina Turner duetted on "Get Back," and uh, the backup band. You might know a couple of the members, Tony. I'm not so sure, but you might. Let's see. There was Phil Collins on drums, Brian Adams on guitar, Elton John. Piano, oh, wow. Eric Clapton on guitar, John Mellencamp on rhythm, and Mark Knopfler. Talk about your all-star band, right? Yeah, no and kidding. And there's Tina Turner and Paul McCartney up front exchanging Get Back. And if I encourage you all, and you know what, maybe we should attach it because that's such a great live version of that song. And, and uh, McCartney and Turner sound amazing together. So check that out, guys. It's um, Tina Turner and Paul McCartney doing Get Back, 1986. 
Well, folks, that's all we've got for today, but it has been an absolute pleasure doing this episode. Aaron, uh, great chat again, as usual. Thanks so much. Uh, Right back at you. I love our chats. Me too. And folks, uh, you have no idea how many tech troubles we've been having tonight. (laughs) If you could only see. And, you know, thank thank goodness I'm, I'm... pretty up to snuff on the tech stuff but uh, we had to switch to a totally different uh, recording system tonight but we were able to do it uh, pretty much on the fly so thank goodness and um, we appreciate so much that you've listened to us all season we've got one more episode after this one and then we're done season 10 but before you get too worried uh, or are we well that's right we have decided that we are going to do the stewie tune show christmas bonus so look for that uh that'll be just our little gift to you and then we'll take a break over the holidays and we'll be back with season four in january and uh, we have some huge news but i'm not going to reveal right now but some huge news about uh, who our first guest in season four is i'm so excited about that me too but in the meantime stay safe be well and we'll see you next time thanks for listening to the stewie tunes show follow us on social media or visit us online at stewietunes.com and if you're enjoying the show don't forget to click subscribe